Hey everyone, this is Nick Jorgensen with Acts 29, and you are listening to You Were Born for This podcast today. And in this episode, as you can already tell, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Uh, when we came in to record this episode uh, this morning, Father John felt the Lord had put something on his heart in prayer to share with the faithful. And after some discussion, Mary and I wholeheartedly agree. So we're going to turn off our mics right now and just let Father John share what we believe is a word from the Lord for the church right now in these days. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Mary. It's good to have you guys around the table. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, what we're entitling, What Time Is It? But as always, let's pray first, huh? So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Father, in these uh, days that are so soon after the Feast of Pentecost, we continue to ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon each of us, members uh, of the body of Christ, in a new way, a fresh way, and that you would pour out that same Spirit upon our country right now, most especially into the hearts of those who, for whatever reason, are hurting, are crying, are confused, are anxious, are fearful, or longing to be heard, or misunderstood. Father, we ask that you would do what only you are able to do in these days, namely that you would change our hearts, give us new hearts, and help the church to be at this time, wherever we may find ourselves, a sign and an instrument of unity and of healing. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So, yeah, Nick, uh, Mary, thanks so much for uh, throwing the mic at me, I guess. Um, so just to contextualize everything, so we're in the middle of a series that we began just last time on a, a, what we call a white paper. doesn't really matter what that is. It's, it's, it's simply just a paper that we recently wrote, we've put out on our website, entitled Reimagining What a Catholic Parish Can Be, a Destination for the 21st Century. You can access that directly. Go to imaginethis.axe29.org. Axe29 is A-C-T-S-X-X-I-X.org. Now, as we do this, um, obviously, we're pretty mindful of everything that's going on in our country right now. So we have this heartbreaking and horrific killing of George Floyd. We have the demonstrations taking place in so many cities right here in our own city, Detroit. Um, those are both peaceful and not so peaceful. We've got the ongoing conversations, again, both peaceful and not so peaceful, which are consuming television, radio, the internet, uh, most of our time. And what seems like an increasing inability to have what I might call reasonable discourse on massively important matters. And I have to say, even as we were praying before we began the podcast, you know, this is something that myself, Father Prentice Tipton, who I used to serve with at Our Lady of Good Counsel, uh, several other great friends of mine, we have felt for so long that there is a need to speak into what's going on in our country. And this was before all the pandemonium that just kind of broke out uh, over this last week, 10 days, two weeks. So anyway, as we prepared for this podcast today, it became apparent in prayer that uh, what we wanted to talk about, we actually think overlays providentially with what's happening around us. So here's a quick way to understand how all of this fits. So as we talk about reimagining what our parishes can be, one of, only one of the things that we try to highlight is that a parish, which is to say the body of Christ, is supposed to be a place where unity and forgiveness are both seen and experienced. In other words, parishes are supposed to be places which are strikingly different, uh, not homogenous. You know, like how many of us have belonged to now, come from parishes, maybe used to belong to parishes, which more or less just all looked alike. But a parish is, at least ideally, right, because this is the church, it's supposed to be a people made up of all races, male, female, rich, poor, all gathered together around the person of Jesus and what he's done for us. 
by his death and his resurrection. So, you know, we've talked often as a team of late, we've all kind of fallen in love with this uh, really extraordinary series, which is out called The Chosen, which I can't encourage people enough to watch, uh, about the life of Jesus. And uh, there's this powerful scene. I remember the first time I watched it, I think I've watched it three times now, but there's a scene where Magdalene, after she's been delivered by Jesus from the demons that tormented her, uh, she's trying to explain to somebody what's taken place in her life. And she simply says this. She says, I was once one way, and now I am completely different. And what happened in between was him, meaning Jesus. And that's the body of Christ, right? This, that's the source of our unity. We all were one way. Now we are completely different, although at least in my case, uh, I'm, I'm completely different, but I'm still bumbling and stumbling, you know, all the time. And what happened to me, to us, was him. And quite honestly, that's pretty much, in many cases, the only thing we have in common. And it's really the only thing that matters. So what we want to do in this episode is we want to speak into what's found in the early part of uh, our paper on reimagining what a Catholic parish can be in the section that we entitle, What Time Is It? And in doing so, we just want to take a, a quick look at what's often called a change of eras. And then we want to talk about how that change is manifesting itself in the chaos, both in the country and the church right now on so many levels. And then we want to offer some prayerful thoughts for what God may be, may be asking us to do right now. So here's my assumption at the start. Um, you might be listening right now and you, you might not identify yourself as a disciple of Jesus. And if that's the case, I mean, we're just delighted you're here. Um, that's great. Please don't turn it off. Uh, we, we really are honored to have you here with us. But in a particular way, I really want to speak um, presuming that I'm talking to disciples of Jesus because it's going to be important for some of the things I want to try to say, which is to say we're, we're not speaking to people who like, I, I happen to be Catholic, that's not what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Rather, we're, we want to presume that we're speaking to people who have encountered the Lord, have heard his invitation to surrender to him, and they're at least aspiring to follow him and to have their minds and hearts conform to his mind and heart. So first, what time is it? So it's often been described that, that our time is not so much a, an era of change, but rather it's a change of eras. And what we mean by that is that we're living in a time that is transitioning from what's often called a, a Christendom era to an apostolic era. And I'll mention again at the, at the end of the episode, but there's just an extraordinary book that I really want to encourage people to read that I've, I think I've spoken about on a number of occasions and the on other podcasts entitled From Christendom to Apostolic Mission. It's published by the University of Mary. If you read one book this year, we would ask you to read this book. That would be my plea, and to give it to your pastor, especially. So what does it mean to move from a Christendom era to an apostolic era? Well, in the, in the foreword to the book, or the introduction to the book, there's a quote from Fulton Sheen way back in 1974. And Sheen says this, Christendom is economic, political, and social life as inspired by Christian principles. So in other words, um, it's something like the vision, the worldview that holds sway in most people's minds is a worldview that is very much shaped by the gospel, even if people don't know that. And that's not to say that everybody's aspiring to be a saint. It's just that the way they think uh, and the way the world operates, the, work, the way culture has been infused and formed and shaped in countless levels— has been infused, informed, and shaped by Christianity. An apostolic era means that another vision or other visions of the world and of reality is what's shaping how people think and how they see things. And those other visions are sometimes um, either ignorant or they're hostile to a Christian vision of seeing things. So, one of the first things to stress here is that this isn't to say that like the people out there who don't go to church, their minds have been formed by the world. It's really to say it's worth 
remembering that for most of us anyway, it's safe to say that the way we think, like clergy, people in the pews, people on staff, uh, bishops, our way of thinking has been shaped in large part by a vision which is not always in keeping with Scripture and with what Revelation has revealed to us. Or maybe sometimes it's a mix, and so it leads oftentimes to challenges, right? And certainly the people in our pews, oftentimes on Sunday, uh, our minds have been shaped more by the world than by the gospel. And how can this not be, right? So you go to church, you know, an active churchgoer is somebody who goes, what, twice a month, I think is how they define it. So twice a month, and maybe you get a homily for eight to 10 minutes, and you get a couple of readings of scripture, and you get some songs. So you get that juxtaposed to more or less 24-7 soaking in the internet, TV, radio, movies, all sorts of other things. Which one of those is shaping my mind? I mean, so how can it not be that people's minds have been formed more by a worldly way of thinking than uh, by scripture and by revelation. So that's the time that we're living in. We're shifting from Christendom to apostolic. Um, how does this change of eras manifest itself? And one of the implications, and the author to this book that we mentioned highlights this, one of the implications is that in a non-biblical vision of reality, there is uh, a denial of the fall of the human race. And that's really significant. Because one of the key principles of the gospel proclamation, right? Not, not the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the gospel, the gospel that's power, is the really frank, uh, stark, barren acknowledgement that there is something horribly wrong with our world and it needs to be fixed. The question is, what's wrong? We, we were talking the other day, you know, about problems and problem solving. And the key to problem solving is to first identify what's the problem. And if you get the problem wrong, whatever we come up with might be interesting, but it's not going to address what we really need to address. So what's the problem? And as we've said here before, in a scriptural vision of reality, one of the results of the fall is that we as a race unknowingly sold ourselves into slavery. And we sold ourselves into slavery to powers that we can't compete against. Those powers are sin and death, which are both best written with capital letters. And to say that these things are powers, the way scripture talks about this is to say that they're like governments. That's the word that's used here. Huh? Um, they're like authorities or rulers. They're, they're exerting pressure on us, trying to get us to connive with them to rebel against God. And here's the key. Their motive uh, is not a benign one. Their motive uh, isn't simply to rebel against God. Their motive is to enslave and degrade us. And when you deny this, when you live in an age which is not shaped by uh, a Christian vision, well, you have to find a new place to locate the cause of evil. Now, you know, like some of us are old enough to remember Flip Wilson, right? The devil made me do it and all that. So this isn't to say that every time, you know, evil's done by somebody, we simply go, you know, we blame the devil. Uh, there was a great book written uh, way back in the 70s of all times by a psychiatrist, not a bishop, but a psychiatrist, Carl Menninger, entitled Whatever Became of Sin. Uh, Pius XII, way back in 1950, said the most serious sin of our age is a loss of the sense of sin. But it when we sin, when we do evil, uh, the scriptural vision is that what we're doing is we're conniving with, we're cooperating with these forces and powers that are hostile, again, not simply to God, but also to us. And what they're trying to do, they're trying to tear us apart. That's their, that's their goal, because their enemy is not just of God, but of the human race. So if you deny that, well you got to come up with somebody else to blame, right? So it's the Christians, or it's the Muslims, or it's the Jews, or it's the rich, the poor, the blacks, the whites. It's, it's men, it's women, it's the environmentalists, it's whoever, right? It's the Yankee fans. you got to find somebody to blame. 
So an initial key here is to understand um, this really simple point that I don't need to be tweaked. You know, I don't need some kind of minor adjustments. You know, Chris was talking to us earlier today about going to the chiropractor because she had some problems with her back. She got an adjustment. I don't need an adjustment. The human race doesn't need an adjustment. The human race needs to be remade. That's the first thing to understand. And the second thing to understand is I have to rightly identify the true enemy. And the true enemy is the devil and his agents who are sin and death. So what's wrong with the world is me. Scripture tells us that no one is just. No one. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, reminds us that Jesus died for the ungodly. Who are the ungodly? I am. You are. Everybody is. And it's been you know, famously said uh, by a number of people now, um, the dividing line between good and evil, it runs through the human heart, runs through my heart. So one of the things that's always kind of infuriated me as a, a priest is how often I'll hear somebody say, especially when they read something in a, a headline or they they see a, a story, maybe a scandalous story about somebody doing something, you know, really terrible of one kind or another, or something like, oh my gosh, like I would never do that. That infuriates me because Christians don't talk like that. Or at least they shouldn't. The saints don't talk like that. The saints never said things like that. The saints said, uh, there but for the grace of God go I. Because the saints knew, as you and I are called to know, uh, that not just other people, but uh, we are, I am, capable of great evil. And if, if you don't know that, if I don't know that, I am woefully naive and unrealistic. And, and I think that, that that all came home to me. I've, I've been, um, I don't want to say blessed. I've had the opportunity uh, three times to go to Auschwitz. I read uh, Elie Wiesel's book, Night, when I was seven years old. And uh, I've always wanted to go there and to pray there and to see it. Because I've just felt so much empathy with, or sympathy for what happened there. Maybe because of the abuse I went through as a kid, I don't know. Which is nothing in comparison to that, but I understand injustice. So the first time I went there, I went there with uh, just a few friends, seminarians. We were there on Holy Saturday of all days. It was uh, the day of Jesus' descent into hell. And I can remember it was cold as ice. and The wind was blowing. There weren't very many people in the camp. This was back in 1992. And we walked into the camp, and almost immediately we all dispersed. Like, even having somebody close to me was annoying. I mean, Auschwitz is haunted. I'm convinced. You can just feel the hatred coming out of the ground and the, and the torment of the people. So the wind's howling. It's bitter cold. Uh, I am immediately agitated. We came to realize afterwards we all were, right? And as I'm looking at the things that are there in the camp, I'm looking at what we, what we did to people. Or what, yeah, what we did to people. And as I'm angry and I'm, and I'm experiencing my, in my own mind, like, just tremendous desires for vengeance. I felt like the Lord just said to me, John, who do you think did this? Like Demons didn't do this. Men did this. Women did this. Men and women who are like you, meaning men and women who are really intense, <laughs> who have a lot of passion. And this is where your thoughts can go. If your thoughts are unchecked by my grace, and suddenly you were allowed to do whatever you wanted. This is what can happen. This is what you are capable of doing. And it was a really humbling, humiliating moment, actually. I'll never forget it. And it reminded me of uh, G.K. Chesterton's reply. Uh, there was a, a famous news story. It was an ongoing uh, editorial, I think, that was written in one of the English papers at the time of World War I. And uh, the question was simply, uh, what's wrong with the world? And Chesterton wrote in one day and simply said, I am. So that, that's 
That's a Christian truth here that I have to acknowledge. So, so how is this manifesting itself in the church right now? What role is the church supposed to be playing with all that's going on in the country? This is the, this is the part that I've just really been frustrated in over the last number of years and have been waiting for something to happen. The, the, the church is supposed to be prophetic. We're supposed to speak both from the pulpit at Mass and then everything else that we do, whether it's, you know, press announcements, media appearances, uh, in our families, our spheres of influence, whatever, we're supposed to speak prophetically. In other words, we're not supposed to sound like the world. We're supposed to deliver a message that God has given to us because that's what it means to be a prophet. You know, uh, you were made, each one of us, if we're baptized, you were made a prophet. You were made to share in Jesus's life, I was made to share in Jesus's life as a prophet on the day that I was baptized. And again, to be a prophet means to speak on God's behalf. And the prophets are raised up all throughout scripture and usually, uh, usually to address one of two things, either to address idolatry and to call people back to right worship or to address injustice. Uh, and injustice is when people who are not getting what they are entitled to and need to be redressed, right? But again, all too often, the church just sounds like the world, or it sounds like a politician. And I think that's because so many of us, I'm, I'm including myself here, we've had our way of thinking shaped by a vision that isn't biblical. And again, the easy way to show that is just like add up the hours you and I spend in the Word of God, you know, in prayer, uh, other devotions, versus the amount of time that we spend uh, imbibing what the world is trying to offer us and the worldview that comes behind it. And the story that came to mind as we were talking earlier, preparing for the podcast, is that story in Joshua chapter 5. So this is as uh, the Israelites are engaged in battle. Huh? And Joshua encounters an angel. And the, the text says when, when Joshua was near Jericho, they're about to attack the people of Jericho. Uh, he looks up and he sees a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? And the answer is neither. I am the commander of the army of the Lord of hosts. And th the reason why that's such an important passage, or I guess the reason why it came to mind is, you know, we often want to believe like God's on my side or he's on our side. Forgetting that I am not in need of being tweaked, but of being remade, and that the dividing line of good and evil runs through every human heart. And God shows, you know, like Scripture is abundantly clear on this, right? He, he shows no partiality. He has no favorites. God is not a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or uh, identifies with any other. God is God. And the challenge is for us to be conformed to him not for us to squeeze him into our own way of thinking. And that's, that's just sorely lacking right now. This, this is what, uh, you know, Martin Luther King, for you know, all, the, all the foibles and, and the misdeeds that he may have committed, or did commit, I guess, perhaps, uh, what King had, the reason why King was so unique, right? King had a vision that was deeply rooted in a biblical vision. King was still living at a time when he could speak using scripture and people understood what he was talking about. And that time isn't in place anymore. And we desperately need prophets to speak up and to be raised up in the church again right now. So, so again, I mentioned, I, I want to give a couple of quick words just to, to close this, but I want to point people again to that book from Christendom to Apostolic Mission pastoral strategies for an apostolic age. It, it really is a timely book for the, for what's going on in the culture. It's very much a timely book for our work in Acts 29. It's informed a lot of uh, how we think. It's certainly a, a timely work for pastors and those who work in parishes and who want to try to reimagine what a Catholic parish can and, and should be. And then Al Cresta and I did a, an interview uh, a week or two ago on Ave Maria Radio and EWTN, and we'll have a link to that in our, our, our podcast as well, and so you can find that. But we tried to talk about this transition from one age to another. We want to encourage people to listen to that as well. But, you know, in closing, let me just share four 
things. I don't want to, you know, as we were talking earlier before we recorded this, we asked the question, like, what's, what's God's prophetic word right now? And I, I don't want to claim that because I don't want to, I don't have enough prayer into all this. So this is not a prophetic word. This is more just more like four things that seem to be very much shaped by what we've shared and from some prayer, but uh, I don't want to say more than that. So four, four last things to say to us right now. The first would be simply this. Uh, we need to stop demonizing one another. So I have to, I have to remember and to humbly acknowledge uh, that when Scripture says no one is just no one, not one, that means me. <laughs> uh, I have to remember I am the ungodly. And I have to remember I'm a part of this race, which needs to be not tweaked, but rescued and redeemed and remade. I'm not apart from them. The problem isn't them. The problem's us. The second thing is uh, nobody can fix what's wrong except God. Now, this isn't to say politics isn't really important. Politics is extremely important, right? Politics is the art of organizing how we s structure our society. So politics matters. But politics can't fix the problem because the problem is the heart. And law can do lots of things. But law can't fix the heart. That's beyond its reach, right? So legislation, as important as legislation is, legislation will never be able to address the root issue. And, you know, we just celebrated the Feast of Pentecost. And that's what Pentecost is all about. I mean, like... All throughout the season of Lent, leading into the Easter season and leading into Pentecost, we would have the constant refrain from Psalm 51, which is David's prayer after he both murders a man and commits adultery with that man's wife. Create in me, O God, a clean heart. And the word that David uses when he says the prayer, create in me, O God, the, the word in Hebrew is bara, which is a word that only God can do. Only God can create. And so it's David's way of saying something like, Lord, here's my heart. You know it. If you don't do something, I'm never going to change. So do something. And then that's exactly what happens at Pentecost. You know, God had promised prophetically, especially through Ezekiel, Jeremiah, that he was going to give to his people, that is to say us, all of us, a new heart. He was going to answer David's cry. And the new heart comes when the Holy Spirit moves into a person's life and, again, doesn't tweak the person, but remakes the person. So th this whole idea of, like, you know, God giving me a new heart, that's not poetry. God's love really has been poured into our hearts, Paul says in Romans, uh, and that's true. And then Fleming Rutledge, you know, who, who we just admire and uh, respect so much in her book, The Crucifixion, she says this, she says, uh, the Messiah came not to a purified and enlightened world spiritually prepared for his arrival, but rather to a humanity no nearer to its original goodness than the, on the day Cain murdered his brother Abel. Indeed, the barbarity of crucifixion reveals precisely that diagnosis. From beginning to end, the Holy Scriptures testify that the predicament a fallen humanity is so serious, so grave, so, so irremediable from within that nothing short of divine intervention can rectify it. The third word would be um, the thing that I guess I, this is the part that I've just been aching for the church to do. The, the third word would be this. The church knows from her own experience that this kind of transformation can happen. Like, this is not, you know, some sort of pie-in-the-sky utopian fantasy or a pipe dream. The church has experience down through the centuries of these things that we're talking about right now taking place. Think of Acts chapter 2, again, the day of Pentecost. Peter's preaching, and the, the, uh, what happens to the crowds is that their hearts are pierced right? And so Peter's preaching about the crucifixion of Jesus, and he's asking the question, who killed him? And the people come to recognize, I did. I killed Jesus of Nazareth. Like, Jesus is on the cross for me. 
So we, we, the church has experience of this, of, of a heart being pierced and of repenting. The church knows from her own experience that people's hearts can change. You, you know, think of St. Paul for crying out loud. Paul goes from being a murderous man who has ex, uh, experience of, memories of, ripping apart families, dragging men out of their homes, uh, leading them off to court, the death of Stephen, and he becomes the apostle of the Gentiles. He's able to come to a place where Paul can say, I once was an arrogant man, which has always struck me. You know, oftentimes when we hear people tell their conversion stories, it's almost like they're bragging about how sinful they were. It's really not a conversion story. It's more like, oh yeah, you think you were really bad? Man, let me check out what I did. And it, it seems like they're longing for what was past. So they talk about all sorts of, you know, sexual proclivities or whatever, or cheating of different kinds. Paul says something really different. Paul says, I used to be really arrogant. You don't really hear that from people very often. W what an amazing thing to say. Talk about self-knowledge. I was an arrogant Man, there's no boasting of like, man, what a great guy I was. I mean, to say that I was arrogant is a tremendously humble acknowledgement of the kind of man I used to be. I used to think so highly of myself. And then I didn't anymore. And what happened was him, right? And then the church knows from her own experience that people who used to be enemies get to a point where they don't just tolerate each other. This is the word that our culture seems to love. Like, we got to have increased tolerance. Tolerance is not a virtue. The, the church isn't into tolerance. The church is into love, right? The church has experience of people who used to be at each other's throats, who used to identify the other as the problem, not tolerating each other, but actually becoming friends, becoming family, calling one another brother and sister. You know, I think over and over again in the passage in Ephesians when Paul says that Jesus has knocked down the dividing wall of hostility. We talked about that in a podcast not too long ago, that Jews and Gentiles used to be at each other's throats. Jesus changed all that. He brought them into a place where there was tremendous unity. Other people saw it, and that sign brought more people into the church because people saw what no one else could deliver except God, namely turning enemies into friends. One of the heroes in my life is a guy named Father Sixtus O'Connor. He was a Franciscan priest, a uh, U.S. soldier. He was a chaplain who served in uh, Patton's army. And then Patton nominated him because he was uh, fluent in German to be the chaplain to the Nazis in Nuremberg. And O'Connor was, because he was with Patton, he was one of the men who uh, helped to liberate a number of the concentration camps. So he went within a matter of weeks from liberating concentration camps and ministering to and praying for the victims of all that took place there to suddenly ministering to the people who put in place the concentration camps. And you can only imagine what must have been going on in his mind. This is a guy who didn't read about the Holocaust. He saw it, right? And he preached the gospel to these people. And he won some of them to faith. You know, I had the experience, I came to know about this guy because I was in Poland uh, a set of years ago and I'm reading about what happened to one of the, uh, the people who was responsible for several million deaths and I heard he was hung and I saw that he was hung and I, you know, internally I just kind of went, good. Like, you deserve that, you lousy son of a whatever. And then I read his final words were, may Jesus have mercy on my soul. And I went, oh, no, like, I'm, I'm upset at this. Like, I want this guy to pay, which, of course, is not a good thing. Just being honest. And then I, I read about what happened to him while he was in prison awaiting to be hung. Father Sixtus O'Connor preaches the gospel to him, leads the man to repent. They're able to re identify each other as brother. And this man changes his life. I mean, that's, that's what happens in the church, right? So I remember uh, one of the mentors of mine, Father Francis Martin, he says, real revolution is not the oppressed toppling the oppressors and then oppressing them like anybody can do that, right? Real revolution is the oppressors and the oppressed becoming family and laying down their lives for each other. And the church knows this. The church has experienced this. And we need to start speaking of this and not to imitate the world and politicians 
And then the last word would be this. There is a lot to do right now. There's a lot to, to do to transform systems that are desperately in need. But for a lot of us, the first thing to, to do isn't actually some, well, it is to do, but it's, it's not an action like that. I think the first thing to do for many of us is actually to just listen and to hear each other. I, I hear people say things to others who have experienced trauma and they say things like, why can't you just move on? I heard a man say that to me the other day. His wife said to him, like, why can't you just move on past this? He went through horrific trauma. They just don't understand that. But we really need to hear each other right now. We, we were talking, the, the three of us, you guys were talking from your own experience of married life. You know, I just asked the question, I think I asked you, Nick, like, your wife comes to you and says a problem and you immediately do what? You go, how can I fix this? And you start to fix it. And then, like, she doesn't want that. I say, Mary, what does she want? You're like, she just wants to be heard. Like, that is so spot on, right? That, that doesn't mean that we don't need to fix problems. But the first thing to do is, will you just listen to me? So we, you know, those of us who are married, we got that experience in spades, right? I talked to a guy not too long ago who was abused by a Catholic priest. And by God's grace, he's come back to the church. He's just a heroic man in my mind of what he's done and how he's persevered and let the Lord bring healing into his life. But man, he is just longing still. He's, he's come to a place where he's forgiven what happened to him. But what he longs for is to know that the, the diocese where this happened that they've heard him, that they've acknowledged this. And that, that led me back to Fleming Rutledge's book, The Crucifixion, where, where she says something which I think is just so spot on, and I think it might be the last word here. Where she's talking about how one of the most uh, remarkable places, perhaps the most remarkable place of coming to terms with just horrific atrocities was in South Africa in what's called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission after the uh, apartheid issues there. And Bishop Desmond Tutu, who was an Anglican bishop, was appointed to be the leader of this commission. He's, he's noted, uh, as Fleming points out, for a lot of things, but perhaps most of all for his vigilance, uh, the way she puts it, of preventing his own oppressed people from turning into oppressors themselves. And the reason this came to mind is this quote. So he was in, in New York in 1998, and he was talking about what had happened in South Africa. And he said this. He said, it, it's not, and this is such a, a timely word for both our country right now, for those of us who battle with issues of forgiveness, for those of us who are battling with not understanding why people are having such a hard time forgiving. Uh, I pray this will be a healing word. He said, it's not enough to say, let bygones be bygones. Reconciliation does not come easy. And believing that it does will ensure that it will never be. We have to look the beast firmly in the eyes, he said. We seek to do justice to the suffering without perpetuating the hatred aroused. We recognize the past can't be remade through punishment. Instead, since we know memories will persist for a long time, we aim to acknowledge those memories. This is critical if we are to build a democracy of self-respecting citizens. Then he goes on to say this, as a victim of injustice and oppression, you lose your sense of worth as a person and your dignity. How many people in our country right now are identifying with that? I have lost my sense of worth as a person and my dignity. And Tutu goes on to say, restorative justice is focused on restoring the personhood that is damaged or lost. But restoring that sense of self means restoring memory, a recognition that what happened to you happened. This is what that guy, the... the man I met who was abused by a priest. That's what he wanted to try to convey to the, to the diocese he was talking to. I need you to know, I want you to recognize that what happened to me happened to me and that I'm not crazy. Something seriously evil happened to you. And the nation believes you, Tutu says. That might be a great step for some of us right now. 
in our parishes. Let's pray that our parishes will be places where this is modeled. Let's pray that our parishes will be places where people can see and experience unity and forgiveness. Let's pray that our parishes will become cities on a hill that will attract people who are down in the wilderness, who are lost, who have no hope, who are discouraged, who are fearful, anxious. Help them to know that there is hope. There is reason for confidence. And the reason is that Jesus is Lord and he's bound the enemy and he's defeated the powers of sin and death. And I don't have to give in to him anymore and neither do you. So because of that, do not be afraid. God is with you, and you were born for this. Mm-hmm.